So after its release in December of last year and its cliffhanger ending, the long-awaited DLC for the Callisto Protocol has now released. Titled Final Transmission, the DLC occurs directly after the ending of the main campaign. I played the Callisto Protocol over on my other channel and I absolutely loved it. The game has decent lore and an interesting story, so I was eager to jump back into this and uncover more of the story. Whilst the main game focused on what happened on Black Iron Prison and Callisto itself, the DLC focused more on Dr. Marla, Warden Cole, and the mysterious secret society of Kalipolis, which was much needed as the main game left a lot of this information up in the air, so to speak. Before we dive in, you can watch a video in which I cover the full story of the Callisto Protocol. The link is in the description, but I also need to mention that there will be spoilers in this video for the Callisto Protocol, along with the DLC, obviously, so please proceed knowing that fact. We'll begin with a recap of the main campaign and then get on to explaining Final Transmission. Let's jump in. It's the year 2320 and Jacob Lee and his co-pilot Max Barrow are working for the United Jupiter Corporation, a company specialising in off-world colonisation and the terraforming of other planets and their moons after large parts of Earth had become uninhabitable. Anyway, Jacob and Max were doing shuttle runs and transporting dubious cargo between two of Jupiter's moons, Callisto and Europa. They were being paid so much money that after that trip, they would both be able to retire. At the time, Europa had been attacked in a biological attack which killed lots of people which was thought to have been carried out by a terrorist group called the Outer Way, led by a young woman named Danny Nakamura. Jacob goes off to check on some cargo on his ship, the UJC Charon, and finds the Outer Way have boarded and a standoff takes place, essentially leading to Jacob's ship crash landing on Callisto. Max is pretty much dead, and Jacob is met and taken into custody by a Captain Ferris who also arrests Danny Nakamura. Ferris is the head of security for the nearby UJC operated Black Iron Prison, a maximum security penitentiary known for its brutality and its isolation. They arrive and Jacob gets acquainted with a Dr. Caitlin Marler, a scientist and the chief medical officer for Black Iron. She implants Jacob with what's known as a core device a device intended to monitor vitals and share data with the relevant people. Jacob wakes up in his cell and it seems that between the time he was implanted to the time he woke up, all hell has broken loose. Prisoners have become biophages, extremely violent, monstrous entities. He comes across another inmate, an Elias Porter, who tells Jacob that he can help him get out as he knows Black Iron well, but he needs Jacob to fly them out of there. On his way to meet Elias, Jacob comes face to face with Ferris who attacks Jacob, but Jacob swarms in with biophages and Ferris falls to his death. Reaching Elias, Jacob is told that they needed a hacker in order to access the ship they need to escape. The inmate they need is in a location called the SHU, which stands for the Secure Housing Unit, and Jacob manages to get there. The problem is that the inmate they need is the one and only Danny Nakamura. She refuses to help them and locks Jacob in her cell, telling Elias that Jacob is not all that he seems and not to trust him. After a long trip to the tram station in order to meet up with Elias, the two change into more suitable attire for the harsh climate outside and they talk and it seems that Elias was in prison for murder. But their chat is cut short by a now slightly mutated Captain Ferris who flushes both Jacob and Elias out of the airlock. Jacob gets to Elias but he passes away. He later meets up with Danny and the two begrudgingly agree to work together. They get some transport and after a quick trip to Jacob's crashed ship to see what Jacob was transporting and trying to find evidence of the UJC transporting bioweapons due to the biological attack on Europa. And after not finding what she was looking for, they move on to the hangar where they hope to commandeer a ship. Warden Cole's hologram appears and remotely destroys the only remaining ship, sabotaging their attempt to escape, saying that they cannot leave Callisto. The ship crashing into the hangar causes Jacob and Danny to plunge down into a long sealed area, an abandoned colony known as Arcus. It seems that a contagion ripped through this colony and the former inhabitants are either very dead or very mutated. Just before leaving Arcus, Jacob and Danny find a lab which contains a massive creature which itself contained tiny lava in its stomach. This creature was unearthed by the Arcus colonists after they broke through a thick sheet of ice mining for minerals such as ore. The UJC figured they could bring about accelerated human evolution using the larvae, so they caused the outbreak in Arcus. One subject, Subject Zero, survived and retained all his intelligence, and this subject was known as the Alpha. Before they can leave, a now heavily mutated Ferris attacks Danny and Jacob, but Danny gets infected. They get back to the prison, which is now remarkably different, but Danny is taken and so is Jacob. After being imprisoned by a security bot, he is freed by Dr. Marla and goes to meet with her. 
On the way, Jacob finds an observation hallway, which the Black Iron scientists and staff were using to observe the inmates. At the heart of Black Iron Prison, Jacob arrives at a laboratory, and it turns out the test subjects were the inmates themselves. A very sick Danny is with Marla, and Marla gives her a suppressant, but tells them that they need to extract DNA from the current Alpha, which funnily enough is Ferris, in order to cure Danny. Marla also tells Jacob that as part of their experiment, they released a diluted version of the infection on Europa, meaning that the outer way were in no way responsible for the outbreak on that moon. And that in turn led to Warden Cole, part of a cult called Calipolis, inspired by the results of the Europa experiment, to release it onto the population of Black Iron Prison in order to find a new alpha to usher in the next phase of human evolution. This was to be called the Callisto Protocol, or Directive 1A. Marla then links Jacob's call with Danny's, and he discovers that Danny was on Europa just after the outbreak hit, and her younger sister Lily was killed, which explains why she was so hellbent in finding out who was responsible for the attack, and why she attacked Jacob's ship. What's more is that Jacob knew that they were transporting something dodgy, but he didn't want to even know what it was. All he cared about was that he was getting paid big money. Jacob confronts Warden Cole, who is actually in hologram form, who is talking to individuals wearing gold masks. Cole then forces Jacob to fight his alpha, Ferris. Jacob defeats Ferris and takes his DNA, uses it on Danny and she is cured. Warden Cole tells them both that the data they collected from their experiment at Black Iron will be used for phase two of their plan. Warden Cole then signs off and Jacob and Danny have to run to the escape pods. However, there is only one left. Jacob pushes Danny into the pod, gives her the lava sample as evidence as to what went on there at Black Iron and launches the pod. Jacob is then left to fight against a horde of biophages. He survives, but he is contacted by Dr. Marla. She says that she knows another way off of Black Iron, but then the call is interrupted by a devolved Ferris, and the game then ends. So final transmission takes place straight away. Waking up in another part of Black Iron Prison, Jacob has absolutely no idea how or when he got there. He has no memory of his final encounter with mutant Ferris, but he hears Marla speaking to him and telling him to hurry. She is aware of a transport ship that they can use to escape Black Iron and Callisto. Marla needs her data drives though as they contain evidence that she needs in order to expose Warden Cole and the crimes that Calipolis have committed there. Jacob starts suffering from hallucinations which is in keeping with what he experienced previously, having had hallucinations of his dead friend Max. Marla tells Jacob that he's suffering from dissociative amnesia, which explains why he cannot remember anything. After finding a way to get the door to Marla's lab open, Jacob has another conversation with her. Jacob, you made it. We have to hurry. There's still a chance. But for what? None of this makes any sense. It's just your mind playing tricks. You've been through a terrible trauma. And what about you? There's no escape for me? What changed? You did. I saw what you were willing to do. I regret what I've done, but we have to keep fighting. We have to finish this. Now listen, there's an escape ship waiting for us. Get to the loading bay, and I'll meet you there. Yeah, and then what? Why don't we just fly out of here? We're the most important cargo of all. I've downloaded all of my files to a series of drives. The first one's there. You'll find others along your way. You gave Danny a piece of the puzzle, but recover them all and we can expose Cole. Put a stop to his plans. Yeah. Right, one last job. They're fine, honey. I mean. so what is that day? It held one of my experiments. It broke free when systems failed. Avoid it if you can. Fight it if you must. On his way to the loading bay and after suffering yet more hallucinations, this time featuring Elias, Jacob comes face to face with a different type of security bot, a biobot. Sneaking around the biobot, Jacob narrowly escapes a grisly end and avoiding a dangerous vent trap designed to prevent inmates escaping, he ends up near to the shoe, which in comparison to earlier on, has been completely overcome by the fleshy bioorganic substance. Later down the line, Jacob starts tripping balls. Is it his core? Is he infected? He's plagued by hallucinations, looping corridors, bugs, and messages scrawled in blood across the walls. He then snaps out of it and discovers none of what he saw was real at all. 
Marlon makes contact with Jacob and tells him that the area he is in is fraught with instability, both mental and physical, whatever that means. Jacob is then forced to fight against a biobot. It's tough, but he manages to take it down. Jacob then moves into a factory, an assembly line where security bots are assembled. Jacob needs to move through there in order to get to the loading bay where the cargo ship is docked. Jacob makes it to a lab and discovers the extent of Marla's experimentation. This is Marla's special projects lab, infected subjects lie vacuum sealed. Then Jacob sees something else. For even though Cole and I took different paths, we each had the same goal in mind. Like you, I realize the mistakes I have made. Ironically, this particular mistake may just be our last hope. Jacob? No. No escape. You will never escape. Find. You'll need a replacement to reach the loading bay. I really like that baton. After sinking thousands of credits into his shock baton, Jacob now needs to find a new weapon. He sneaks past some more biobots and eventually gets a kinetic hammer, very useful for destroying and taking down biobots. With not far to go, Jacob's hallucinations get cranked to the maximum. He doesn't know what's real and what's not at this point. Nonetheless, he battles his way down a very long corridor towards the loading bay. He now needs three fuses to open the hatch leading to the loading bay. Marla says she's waiting for him on the cargo ship, and he enters into the garbage chute. Jacob! What are you doing here? The ship's close, we just have to reach the loading bay. Watch out! <laughs> Jacob is naturally very confused, as Marla told him she was on the ship already, but he continues on and gets the fuses needed, opening the loading bay hatch. He climbs down the ladder and sees messages telling him to just give up, descends some stairs and sees more messages telling him that it was all his fault. He enters into the loading bay. Marla has now mutated into a horrific form, and Jacob has to fight her. He succeeds though, and she falls to her death. Jacob exits through to the loading bay and is, to his surprise, on board the UJC Charon, his old ship, inexplicably repaired. He once again, to his surprise, hears Marla's voice, jumps into his seat, and takes off. Then, after a blinding flash of white light, it's revealed. So, poor Jacob is in a right state. Before we go any further, let's look at what the ending means. So the twist is that Jacob didn't actually experience any of this. It was all in his head. Here's what happened. After Jacob sent Danny off to safety, he defeated the horde of biophage infected inmates that were coming for him. Then Marla called him and Ferris popped his head up. Now at this point, Ferris absolutely tore Jacob to pieces, ripped off his arms and legs, but he wasn't dead. Marla journeyed to the Warden's Tower to find out what happened to Jacob, and found him there, barely alive. She took him to her lab and hooked him up to life support, and he was being kept alive. But why? You remember that when Danny was infected and dying, Marla linked Jacob's core to Danny's, allowing him to see part of her memories, including the Europa aftermath in which Danny found her little sister dead. Ever since then, their cores have been linked. Jacob's journey has been the thoughts and hallucinations of a dying man. 
Marla has been uploading evidence, journals and confessions into Jacob's core unit, which is why he was finding loads of data drives containing this information. It was being stored in his core. I guess looking back whilst playing the DLC that there were subtle signs that Jacob was imagining all of this. When Jacob walks into another lab he can see his own inmate number 532521 on a vital screen. There are the hallucinations and the writing on the walls, specific to things that Jacob has done, such as his greed in taking one more job, which resulted in the death of Max. It's his inner guilt. There's also the fifth data drive, which is essentially incoherent ramblings from a dying Jacob, being kept alive by Marla's life support. And in Data Drive 8, Myla says that she is trying to keep the Link alive, the Link being Jacob himself. Right at the end of the DLC, Myla has uploaded all of the information to Danny via Jacob's core, and just as it hits 100%, Black Iron crumbles around them. Myla knew this was going to happen, as she had pretty much resigned herself earlier to dying at Black Iron due to her guilt in partaking in such horrific experiments. But this isn't all. We'll now look into the evidence that Marla uploaded into Jacob's core, which gives us a lot of insight into Calipolis, the biophage, and its origins, and also Dr. Marla's involvement. Let's dive in. In France during the 1300s, the Black Plague was sweeping across Europe, and many thought that it signalled the end of humanity. Rowling Cockart, a scholar who was living in a small fishing village on the southern coast of France, witnessed his entire village killed by the plague. He was the only survivor. He then burned all of the bodies. And then in the smoke, Cockart had a vision. A vision that told him humanity would survive the plague, but that at some point in the future, humanity would cease to exist. Extinction itself was indeed inevitable. But shortly after his vision, Cockart wrote a manuscript known as Mors Edat Nec Facet, which in Latin loosely means, death makes no mistakes. He sought the answer to the question, why do some survive when others do not? Cockart believed it was neither divine providence nor chance. He then came up with something called the commonality, a trait which was neither spiritual nor biological, but that which was shared amongst true survivors. Cockart believed that the commonality would be the thing which would eventually save humanity. This led to Cockart creating a secret group dedicated to studying survival, the commonality, and called this group Calipolis. Going back to Cockart's manuscript, he outlined a particular tradition known as Magna Venari, which translates from Latin to the Great Hunt, the hunting of human prey. Cockart speaks of it as a religious duty, that one must perform the act to demonstrate their willingness to go to great lengths in order to understand what it takes to survive, to cull the weak to find the strong. Sounds kind of similar to what Cole was doing, doesn't it? Releasing an infection into black iron which would kill the weak, but where one sole survivor would prevail. Ferris, the Alpha. But let's continue on. They thought that with this method of survival, they weren't just culling the weak, but they were honouring the commonality. They came up with a name for the sole survivor, Vir Solidarius. Calipolis, or rather members of the Great Hunt, who were themselves high-ranking members of society, would wear golden masks and would quite literally refer to themselves as hunters. The same people Jacob saw Cole conversing with at the end of the game. Calipolis would remain a secret society over the years and continued their great hunt, and they were a society that chose not to get involved in geopolitics. That was until 1919 when one of the Calipolis members, a man named Oliver Ledoux, wrote a book called On the Survival of Man. Ledoux would challenge the theory that human extinction would be the result of a catastrophic outside force. Many of his fellow Calipolis members believed that it would be due to a plague, a view that Ledoux disagreed with. He saw the population growing, and growing fast. He argued that the greatest risk to humanity was in fact humanity itself. Ledoux mentioned that evolution needed a guiding hand, and used the metaphor of a garden overtaken by weeds. That although weeds may also be a more durable species, they still need a gardener in order to tend to them. His question was, who tends to humanity? And the answer for him at least was that it was the duty of Calipolis to ensure that humanity would grow strong. Only one thing mattered, connection to the commonality. As a result of Ledoux's writings, Calipolis called themselves the Crown, believing themselves to be philosopher kings. 
they then turn to a more active state, amassing wealth and influence, and look to exact change across the world. Kalipolis had four tiers to its hierarchy. The crown, which was comprised of 12 members, with each member having their own responsibilities, such as the Master of Arms and the Master of Archives, and all these members are thought to possess the commonality. Then there are bishops, high-ranking members which are hand-selected by the crown to serve as liaisons or middlemen between the crown and standard members. There are knights, which are essentially foot soldiers who protect the crown. And finally, there are pawns, the aforementioned general members. In my original Story Explained video for this game, I looked into the Andes mountain range in Peru, Ecuador and Colombia, and its connection to the inspiration behind the UJC's experiments into accelerated human evolution. On this mountain range, there is a unique ecosystem or an evolutionary hotspot, which is the fastest evolving region on Earth. This is known as Paramo. And this next part also ties into a PUBG map and connects with the lore given that the two games actually share a universe. So here we go. On one of Dr. Marla's data drives, we can read about an ancient city which was itself called Paramo. The city was built on the side of a volcano, and in the 1100s, warrior tribes began to settle in what would become known as Peru. The city was built to be a fortress, and for several hundred years, the city was doing very well. But then one day, without any explanation, everyone completely vanished. Wall carvings suggest that the tribe may have held themselves from the mountainside in the mass ritual sacrifice. Paramo then became a ghost city and was only explored by people who could make the dangerous climb up the mountain. Then in 1982, a group of archaeologists, led by a man named Burton Northrup, travelled to Paramo with the idea of finding out what happened to the city, and so 40 scientists set up camp among the ruins of the city. They learned something. The people of Paramo lived a long life, to around 120 years old, much longer than the average human, and they never got sick at all. The scientists were determined to find out what this was. Something in the water, in the air, was it the volcano or a specific plant? The scientists then started to report feeling healthier and more energetic. But then, two years later, Northrop went missing and the expedition was shut down. It's reported that Northrop entered into a feverish madness and may have even attacked people. It's reported that he may have thrown himself into the volcano. Years later, humans started to shift towards interstellar colonization. A mining facility was built on the Earth's moon, and then decades later, colonies had been established on Mars, leading to the space rush, involving lots of companies all eager to be the pioneers in colonization. Attempts were made to terraform Mars, but it failed. What happened was kept fairly secret, only being known as the Mars Incident. But from this, it seems that an advanced, strong AI was responsible for the incident. But still, the show must go on, and further mining operations and outposts such as Helix Station were set up. That was until 2244, when the microbe or the larva was detected, which produced horrific mutations in the miners of the Arcus colony on Callisto. Arcus was sealed, a cover-up was fabricated, and the UJC was nearly bankrupted. Of course, Kalapolis found out about the microbe, and given their desire for all things evolution, the secret society bankrolled the UJC and had them get to work in researching this microbe. Then in 2250, 70 years before the events of the game, Black Iron Prison was constructed on top of Arcus. They'd not only have direct access to the colony below, but also a large, almost endless supply of test subject in the prisoners. In my other video, I look at what exactly happened to the Arcus research team, but I won't cover that in this one. After 25 years though, research on the microbe yielded little to no results. The UJC and Kalapolis were stumped. The Arcus colony was sealed up, and the research was stopped. Thankfully, we also got a glimpse into how Dr. Marla ended up working at Black Iron Prison. All of the voice logs in the DLC and the notes were written by Dr. Marla. But how did Marla know all this information? About what was essentially a secret group? Let's have a look. Marla herself was part of Kalapolis. Marla reveals what we already know, that she was brought to Black Iron Prison by Warden Cole. Cole, being a bishop, was obviously a higher rank than Marla, who herself was just a pawn in the Kalapolis hierarchy. She mentions that Cole's family are Kalapolis royalty. Nothing like a bit of nepotism. Anyway, Cole thought that he belonged to the crown, but despite his valiant efforts in trying to impress the crown, he could never reach that level. He was determined to ascend to the crown. He acted like he wanted to honour and achieve that for which Kalapolis exists, which was that humanity would become stronger, but Cole didn't care about that at all. He just wanted in. That was his motivation. 
Cole saw his moment when he uncovered the data from the Black Iron Research Program, which was of course shut down decades prior. He'd spotted a link between Calipolis and the Biophage, and Cole thought he'd found the commonality they'd spent so long looking for. Cole became obsessed. He collected trinkets and kept them in his tower, almost like some sort of collector. The manuscript of Morzedat Nek Facet, the golden masks worn by his ancestors, a relief of the Great Hunt, the Molten Goddess Flower from Paramo, Northrop's Journal, a portion of the Paramo Meteorite. It was the forthcoming research program that would bring Dr. Marla to Black Iron, to study the Biophage. She promised herself that she wouldn't cross certain lines, but ended up crossing them anyway in the pursuit of science by experimenting on the prisoners. She too became obsessed. Cole didn't see the Black Iron experiments as a failure though, it produced Via Solitarius. Marla mentions a pure strain of the Biophage, a direct connection to the commonality because Cole believes the Biophage to be the commonality itself. The pure strain is coursing through the blood of the lone survivor. Who is the lone survivor of what happened on Black Iron? Well, it's actually Danny Nakamura. After Ferris's infected DNA was injected into Danny, she became what Cole wanted, the lone survivor. Phase two, Cole only needs to find Danny and he'll have what he wants. Marla then signs off by saying that the truth must be revealed, leading to her uploading all of the evidence to Jacob's link and then sending that evidence to Danny's core in the hope that Cole will be stopped. Will this lead to a Callisto Protocol 2? Maybe. I certainly hope so. Maybe the next game will be playing as Danny. Who knows? But as for Jacob, his story is obviously done. And that's it for this video. If you enjoyed this one, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel to support and leave a comment down below with your thoughts. If you like, you can support me on Patreon for as little as £1 a month. But for now, take care, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.